So, um, Theo started now. Or your, my face is in it. Is your face in it? Yes. Oh, okay. Hello, welcome everybody. <laughs> what, what are we called? Uh, quantum computers. No, we're not quantum computers. Oh, we're not. We are. We are then. Oh. We are the embodiment of materiality computers. So. Okay, very cool. <laughs> quantum mechanics posits that all matter paradoxically exhibits properties of both waves and particles. On the one hand, everything from light to compound molecules can be observed as particles bodies that are unique, finite, and in most cases, material. On the other hand, all of these microcosmic elements are similarly waves, or mere oscillations in an undelimited and dispersed medium that carry some kind of energy as they propagate through that medium. A wave is an entity of pure form and activity, a shape that self-perpetuates and moves through a medium, but is not defined or entirely confined by it. Particles, in contrast, are units of matter confined by their location in both space and time and unacting without outside influence. The proposal that all matter is always simultaneously both is, according to quantum physics, the foundational paradox of the universe. This duality, wave and particle, form and content, universal and particular, moving and stationary, can be observed as operating not only in the realm of quantum physics, but also in the natural cosmos of everyday life. In the summer of 2013, a small group of medievalists and associates embarked upon an experiment to virtually collaborate and delve into Karen Barad's work, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. I'm just posting the video to the public. So, okay. Okay, so our broadcast is now live on air right now. Now, uh, live, live, online. <laughs> <laughs> the group itself was an experiment, bringing together medieval and non-medieval scholars alike, and putting us in conversation with Barad and other new, new materialists to foster an exploration of materiality informed by the best of both the hard sciences and the humanities, and to find the fantastical universe in which those meet. We started as a small group. My name is Angie, and I'm Taylor. Oh, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. Hi, I'm Carl Steele. I'm Ashley Kinch. Hi, I'm Brandon. We grew into a larger one. Hi, I'm Angie. I'm Rob. 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 I'm Angie. i am <laughs> what we bring to you now is a diffractive presentation of the results of our experiment. In uh, Meeting the Universe Halfway in a stack of essays, Karen Barad gives a quantum physicist's rigorous and practical perspective on the philosophical implications of physics for ontology, epistemology, and ethics. As exciting as this work is, and as much as I recognize that quantum physics is physics, and the most accurate physics to date, I'm here to be a bit of a wet blanket. I'm not entirely convinced of the utility of quantum physics in literary studies. And I'm not sure we need or can use its accuracy. If you've made it through a work understanding as much as you can, you know how quantum physics, sorry, just physics, collapses the distinction between ontology and epistemology. Pache Heisenberg is not that things are fundamentally uncertain. It's not that we can't just measure location and velocity at the same time. It's that things are fundamentally indeterminate. Measurements don't just jostle or arrest. They, they generate in two key ways. Measurement forces a probabilistic system to resolve itself in some particular way. And it marks the measuring apparatus. Here's where we're at. Knowledge making is not a mediated activity, but a direct material engagement, the practice of interacting with the world as part of the world in its dynamic material configuring. To illustrate some of the questions quantum mechanics raises about the nature of measurement, I'd like to introduce the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment as an example and return to it throughout. It goes something like this. In a closed box, you put a cat along with a small amount of radioactive substance, a Geiger counter, and a container of cyanide. You set it up so that the radioactive substance is small enough so that within, say, an hour, there is an equal probability that an atom will and will not if an atom undergoes decay, the 
desired amount of registers in, and triggers a hammer to break the container of cyanide, killing the cat. No decay, and the cat lives. As the standard interpretation goes, the cat cannot be said to be alive or dead, but rather exists in a linear combination of dead and alive. This indeterminacy is not resolved until a human observer intervenes and opens the box. Thus, if you look in and find a dead cat, it is technically you and your act of observation that is killed. Okay, so this is Sandra, and she is presented to us by our avatar. And clearly, we are having a technical In Marx's based critical theory, relates to the structural reproduction of power through ideology derived from Althusser's theory of ideological state apparatuses. Barat. involved in scientific observation. In advocating for apparatuses, which effectively stand for the inseparability of the object and the measuring agency, the Barodian model implies that there is no subject, no self, no subjectivity per se, because there are no predetermined boundaries that delineates subject and object, observer and observed. Metzinger similarly argues that in the phenomenological sense, subjectivity is a dynamic process whereby experiential self disperses into time-space. Barad defines apparatuses as boundary-drawing practices. In other words, apparatuses generate boundaries to their material dispersive engagement with the environment. As such, Boundaries are not predetermined prior to the emergence of the apparatus. Barat also calls these boundary drawing practices a gentle cut. And a gentle cut is an act that contingently separates out distinct entities and meanings within the parameters of a particular experiment, context, situation, or phenomenon. But the agency required to conduct such an action is not something anyone or anything can be said to have or possess as if it were an individual power of which only certain beings are worthy. It is, rather, something that happens. The ontological status of an agential cut is fundamentally a mental, not discrete and individual. As such, agential cuts are intraactive rather than interactive, because the entities whose boundaries agential cuts constitute emerge through their relation. They do not exist as such prior to as Brad puts it, quote, in contrast to the usual interaction, which assumes that there are separate individual agencies that precede their interaction, the notion of interaction recognizes that distinct agencies do not proceed, but rather emerge through their interaction, end quote. Moreover, for Brad, a gentle cut concern both material and discursive distinctions. This means that both scientific acts of measurement and critical acts of literature equally classified as agential cuts. Even though measurement seems more materially oriented and interpretation seems more linguistically oriented, both acts contain material and discursive components. To quote our organizer and Segler on this point, quote, making an agential cut, however, isn't strictly a scientific process. It's an interpretive process, one that we are all participating in all the time. It is the approximation that we must make in order to make sense of our universe. A sufficiently accurate physics makes the innocent critical bystander impossible. There's no way just to represent the interpreted object, literary work, or its relation to author or historical surroundings, and so forth. Because the phenomenon within which interpretation occurs resolves the interpreted object in some particular way, and because the interpreter itself occurs within the same phenomenon. This is not because the interpreter is already there, but rather because the interpreter is marked in some way by what it interprets. Nor can the interpreter be assumed to act in present matter removed from the interpreted object's past, because, again, the sufficiently accurate physics. There is no absolute distinction between past, present, or future, nor cause and effect, except as a description of the ways that particular kinds of attention construct particular kinds of temporality and causality. 
To put this in more familiar terms, phenomenological and effective literary criticism goes far toward realizing the variety of project called terrorist modes which stress, stress the careful division of present day critic from past to object, remain locked in the certainties of classical physics. And as much as a fan as I have been of literary criticism that has engaged with Barat, not least while Stacey Alamos, I'm still dubious as a literary critic. It's not just that I suspect I'm likely to get the physics wrong. I can count one medievalist who's good at both physics and medieval literary studies, and it's not me. <laughs> um, more importantly, the phenomenon where I describe are imperceptible on the scale at which a specifically literary scholarship operate and what kinds of materials being investigated. Miles Bohr observed that if the discontinuity of reality caused by Frank's constant had been larger, humans would never have thought they lived in a classical world. That said, Planck's constant is a constant. And humanity scholars, for the most part, do not feel themselves to be moving instantaneously across the absolute minimum of gaps with quantum leaps. I presume they don't. The same problem applies to relativity. At typical human speeds, we get along well enough with believing space and time to be constants. The humanities generally get by just fine with a good enough picture of reality. Whatever the claims that promoters of MOOCs or automatic essay grading software, the best humanity is teaching, works slowly and in comparison to physics, sloppily. And the apparatuses of literary investigation are not precise enough to discern or determine quantum effects. It is extremely difficult to observe quantum effects on a more or less unassisted human century scale, or even simply to observe multiple entangled particles since every additional pair of entangled particles increases the complexity of the phenomenon exponentially. Extremely difficult, but in all fairness, increasingly not impossible. Recently, physicists entangled half a million atoms so that an effect on one would affect the other 499,999 atoms at a distance. Quantum physics predicted the possibility of macroscopic spin singlets, and now one's been observed. But I find it hard to imagine the spooky action of distance being observed in, say, a library. And even harder, though perhaps not possible, to imagine the value of doing so. Barat aims to identify nothing less than the elements of scale in which subjects are co-constituted in their interaction with the physical universe. Can we, from the particle level analysis of quantum physics, reconstitute the subject on the sending scale? Barat thinks we can or at least things that are meaning of the board interpretation authorizes us to consider our entanglement with the quantum world as a co-constituting element of our subject formation. She conscious, consciously links her project with the Foucauldian critique of the subject. I'll read a longer quote that I'm not going to read here. Extending the concept of subject formation from micropolitics to the subatomic world. Throughout her work, Barat warns us not to use these quantum concepts as a metaphor. She's sharply critical of analogy as a method, and sees metaphor and configuration more generally as inherently tied to the foibles of the linguistic term, particularly if they're being used to negotiate the risks between the micro and the macro, the scientific and the social, or nature and culture, which often map onto one another with the first term in each pair corresponding to the scientific or matter, often it scales indiscernible to direct human experience, and the second to the domain of the humanities, with its hold on language and cultural phenomena at scales that correspond to the experiential capacities of the human sensorium. At the same time, one of the things that characterizes Brad's work is her insistence on the inseparability of matter and meaning, as well as her post-humanist sense that an agenda of liveliness permeates all matter. This means that Barat is invested in producing a post-humanist onto epistemology, which locates the capacity for agency and signification within the purvey of both inorganic and organic forms of materiality. One of the questions that I ask then is what happens to the concept of metaphor in Barat's onto epistemology? Where does it reside in these non-human, interactive, discursive material becomings? Barat's work resonates. And this morning's talk by Monteza Gari provides a key metaphor for the extension of this verb we use in the humanities, an amplified constructive appearance within a closed dynamic wave system. It resonates with other approaches to the 
denying human impact on, on human subjects, as articulated in Jane Bennett's Fire of Matter. Jane. Jane. Dane's work. Jane. Jane Bennett, you know, Fire of Matter. Jane Bennett. And Stacey Alano's transcorporeality. We encountered models for thinking about the desubjectified matter that occupies and passes through the human being in ways we found tantalizingly analogous to those images of zodiac man that imprint uh, the stars directly on the naked human body, producing uh, an image of a body traversed by matter. We also observed matter accumulating agency in the human body in the process of accumulating mass which at a certain threshold of scale passes from inert to agential, from benign to malignant. Is the human subject something like that? An accumulation of neural signaling that passes a thresh threshold at which it scales up from a disordered material pattern, indecipherably complex, to an ordered pattern that feeds back into the way we process the world. Is what we call consciousness merely the passing across a threshold of scale in which the intensity, pattern, and circularity the neuronal information crosses from one systematic model to another. In her lecture, Fortune's in an edition, the modern writer Gershon Stein writes that if anything is alive, it is not repeating. Instead, it is always different from any other version of itself, producing a series of variations rather than a continuity of a self-same discrete identity. In order to illustrate this statement, Stein evokes the example of a living organism. It is very like a frog hopping, she writes. He cannot ever hop exactly the same distance or the same way of hopping at every hop. But Stein here is not talking only about frogs or other living organisms, or even anything that is typically considered living in a biological sense. She's writing about the liveliness of stories. No matter how often you tell the same story, she suggests, just before bringing up the example of the hopping frog, if there is anything alive in the telling, the emphasis of the story will be different from any other kind that the story has been told. There is something similar about Stein's conception of liveliness and the radical sense of aliveness that permeates the world according to Barat, in which it appears in the adjective capacity of matter, propelling it along changing patterns of difference. This sense of iterative production of different differences transformed the conception of matter in Brad's view of a fixed essence or property of things into a lively, generative, and differentiated performative enactment. But Barad specifically prizes a differentiation that is distinctly not a representational, mimetic, or reflective type of optics that we're used to. In a somewhat classical mindset, Aristotle and Descartes both wrote on optics and developed a classical models of representation from different classical moments. In classical optics and the representationalist metaphors we draw from it, light comes into a surface and bounces off precisely and completely, producing a reflection that is assumed to have a one-to-one -one relationship to its reference. The law implies that representationalist systems of knowledge production are dualist. She argues that in her phenomenological framework of the entanglement of meaning and matter, the physical and conceptual apparatuses form a non-dualistic whole. This means that, according to Barad, representationalist models are founded on the assumption that objects have predetermined qualities that exist prior to their involvement in phenomena, and that matter is passive and immutable. Borat's theory collapses the polar distance between internal and external representation, which, as representationalist schema, create the illusion of objectivity and mirror reflection, which Borat invalidates. She instead endorses a diffractive methodology for generating patterns of difference. If reflection is part of our understanding of the behavior of light and the visual sense based on particles, photons, to 
Diffraction describes the effects of light as a wave. When a wave travels through a slit, as in this image, the wave spreading out from the slit, uh, oh, excuse me, the wave is bent by the obstacle in its path, and what comes out the other side is a pattern of concentric waves spreading out from the slit that the original wave bit traveled through. This is also true when light, or any wave, travels around an object. The edges of the object bend the light a little, creating two waves that then inter interfere on the other side. Interference is what creates diffraction patterns, like this pattern on the right-hand side of the ball. We can understand the results of this interference by thinking about ripples in water. When two sets of ripples are set off, the place where they meet is uh, is a set has a set of overlapping waves. This is their interference. When the peaks of waves overlap, the size of the wave doubles. When a peak of a wave meets with the trough of another, they cancel each other out, and we see only a flat surface instead. Diffractive reading, then, takes account of various phenomena and movements as each setting off their own ripples and investigating the patterns at places of interference. Science-based studies of consciousness reveal that the problem of the constitution of the subject depends on identifying threshold changes where one scale yields to another. The widely criticized Roger Penrose and Stuart Hamroff's theory of orchestrated objective reduction has drawn the most sustained attention to the possibility of quantum effects in the brain, which they argue will be localized in fine scale quantum vibrations inside the microtubules of neurons. Though skeptical of quantum consciousness, Stanislav and Hen in his lab have for two decades been studying threshold states, in and out of anesthesia, in and out of comas, offering fine-grained analysis of the subtle differences between non-responsive patients that turn out to indicate monumental differences in neural activity. His work defines consciousness by shifting scales of the neural register, demonstrating neat neural si signatures that accompany consciousness. The results indicate that an oscillating brainwave pattern rooted in a recursive and very widely distributed network with a specific electric, electrical signal marks the state of self, self awareness we call consciousness. At a specific threshold, so called primary brain states like sensory stimuli feed into these larger wave patterns that allow us to be conscious of the perception. I want to speculate on a provisional idea informed by classical drama, fictional narrative, dramatic art, and character development as points of departure. I claim that it is through the dramatization of differences in oppositional category construction that embodiment of objective meaning making takes shape. Dramatization is a way of amplifying difference for the participant in the context of complexity. The way I'm reading Barad, she implies that representationalist systems of knowledge production are, of course, dualist. And as dualism, she references, reminds me of contrast and conflict, which are substrates of classical drama. But there are also non-fictional narratives, such as the knowledge-producing narratives we as researchers engage in. For example, a study in the social sciences causes problems to be solved and research questions to be answered. This act of answering a research question is dramatic. The unknown behind the question mark propels researchers. Much of the motivations of dramatic characters propel a fictional narrative forward to meekly engage with the act of discovery on both the material and dispersive level. There is an underlying assumption of difference in the act of getting to know the unknown that generates meaningful engagement for the researcher, i.e. observer, that moves the researcher into action and embodies participation. In other words, the dramatization of differences may not only amplify meaning, but also amplify the material subjective engagement with meaning. I would like to suggest that this dramatization of differences creates effective engagement with the complex, nuanced details of a study phenomenon. 
This means acknowledging the possibility that embodied meaning making processes are related to how we as humans express diversity and complexity through reduction. That is, drama, conflict, contrast, and difference. In order to excite interest and move us to action and reaction. Recursive processes allow us to attend to and redirect our impulses. And this level of awareness allows us to intervene in the mechanistic processes at the lower scales. Our brains are not well described by a continuous speed forward scaling up of sensation, which dominated artificial intelligence for years. Feedback cycles of great sophistication and complexity alter the system at every level, crossing scale thresholds that dramatically alter the input. These oscillations also create a different time scale, slower and much more broadly distributed than the high speed processing view at the sensory level. Benjamin, Benjamin Libet's famous 1985 study of the lag between our brain's readiness for action and our conscious intent to act points to a temporal gap whose significance was immediately felt by philosophers prepared to deny the very notion of free will. In a reductive formulation, we might say that the scale of the subject is 200 milliseconds, the average measure of that gap after which consciousness supposedly comes limping lamely along. But of course, that's absurd. Whatever mystery still holds in our understanding of will, it is not constructed by the responsive constraints of our motor sensory system. And further studies have shown that we can exercise both our free will and, more importantly, perhaps, our free won't in response to stimuli at very fast speeds between 200 and 500 milliseconds. Of course, that's really slow in relative terms compared to the smallest scale of time in which we have observed the physical world, 12 attoseconds, or, <coughs> or the chemical world of our brain, 200 femtoseconds. On this scale of time, where a, uh, where a femtosecond is to a second, where a second is to 31.7 million years, 200 milliseconds starts to look like a place to get a lot of framework done. While our neurons fire at imperceptible speeds, our subjectivity is a slower thing, made up of convoluted twists and turns, gaps and leaps of scale. The scale of the subject, indeed, is, in Murad's word, iteratively reconstituted as space-time matter is reconfigured. That reconstituting of scale is a decisive feature of human thought, one of the ways we attempt to describe, manage, and control the un unimaginably large and unthinkably small scale of space, time, and matter that the world presents us. We in the humanities might stereotypically be abject failures at time management, valid, uh, at practicing the philology that Nietzsche demands of us. Uh, we are expert. We are expert at time re reversal, at slowing time down, scaling the moment, to become slow, to read slowly, deeply, looking cautiously before and after. To return to fictional narrative and classical dramas, conveyors of difference, should we assume that dramatic contrast and conflict are not present in patterns of difference because Barad argues that diffraction is a more subtle way to perceive difference. By actively discounting contrast and conflict in difference, i.e. oppositional category construction, are we reducing the subject's meaningful engagement with content? And are we eliminating individuation, the subject's false sense of its own embodied boundary? Unnecessary fiction, perhaps? There is an uneasy paradox here. Dualism implied in Barad's view on representationalism and its oppositional attributes, which create contrast for purposes of increasing distance between categories, perhaps for the goal to isolate an object and study it in a controlled environment. And fictional narrative in classical drama creating contrast for the purposes of increasing in the distance between categories in order to bind human subjectivity to the world through affect, excitement, action, and reaction. All of this is to discuss the impact of Barrage on the human scale, the way human perception enters into quantum subjectivity. But as Alaimov has already told us, and Sam 
venerable remind us, even human subjectivity is not without its non-human actors. I would like to briefly address what Finnick and Cohen's rubber hand illusion experiment in this context. The rubber hand experiment is an event of experiencing a rubber hand much like a phantom limb as part of one's own body when strolled synchronously with one's own hidden hand. According to Bobinic and Cohen, subjects record feeling what is my hand through the embodied sense-making process of proprioception, vision, and touch. Human consciousness establishes its sense of self as incorporating objects that are not part of its physical body. Neuroscience labels this process an illusion. In other words, the fact that a human consciously feels the rubber hand or a digital avatar as part of his or her body is a process that enables human subjectivity to diffuse into the environment. The rubber hand um, illusion echoes Morales' discussion of moral content of the blind man and his stick. The stick is not only an extension of the blind man's body, a bodily auxiliary in moral content terms, but also is actively incorporated into his body through his habitual use. As Barad argues, it is the breakdown, not simply of an instrument employed by the body, but of the very self. The rhetorical strategy of calling the rubber hand an illusion in the rubber hand illusion experiment is to denote that there is an opposite, a real, perhaps, whereby the subject perceives him or herself as intact and compact. We could point to an assumption in the rubber hand illusion of perceiving reality when no such category exists. If we draw on the last theory, we could argue that the rubber hand illusion is not an illusion, but part and parcel of an apparatus of subjectivity interpolated through diffractive sense-making processes. In her critical departure from the representational metaphor of mirror reflection, Barat quotes here that reflexivity or reflection invites the illusion of a central fixed position while diffraction trains us to more subtle vision. Despite the fact that Barad uses the term illusion to qualify representationalist paradigms, the subtle vision facilitated by diffraction undermines the dramatic qualities of contrast and conflict that may characterize difference. As a scientific methodological tool, diffraction blurs difference and rhetorically speaking, may be disembodying human perception from its effective engagement with the world. I am not claiming that humans cannot embody or interpret subtle differences to diffractive, reflective, or any other means. Rather, I am arguing that the dramatization of differences may amplify material embodied and embodied engagement with content. This argument is purely a speculation on the power fictional narrative, classical drama, and its derivative metaphor to move humans into action, a potentially implicit and tacit strategy of material and embodied engagement, fiction, storytelling, and scientific knowledge production. So, on the one hand, fiction itself may be an apparatus for making an agential cut to constitute the human subject or the neural lag inside the brain itself uh, may itself make an agential cut. But humans are not the only ones who can make agential cuts, and thus demonstrate some kind of agency, or quasi-agency, as Bennett calls it. Ursula Le Guin dramatizes this point in her 1974 short story titled Schroeder's Cat, in which she wonders, what if we consider the cat as a material animal presence? rather than an abstract figuration. If we recognize that the cat, not to mention the guy encounter, the radioactive substance, and the cyanide, too, qualifies as an actor, the experiment's implications have changed completely. As Le Guin puts it in the introduction to her story, quote, the real presence of an animal in a laboratory 
that is, an animal perceived by the experimenting scientist as the sentient existence of the same order as the scientist's existence, would profoundly change the nature and probably the results of the experiments. End quote. So how does the presence of Schrodinger's cat change the nature and results of the experiment? It makes the experimenter's observation redundant. That is, the interaction of the Geiger counter, cyanide container, the radioactive substance, and the cat must qualify as a measurement. Thus, when the experimenter takes a peek inside the box half a layer, she is late to the measurement part. The reason humanists and physicists alike have such trouble grasping this point is that we cannot imagine measurement occurring without human involvement. The agential exceptionality of an act of measurement is directly tied to the epistemological and ontological exceptionality of the human. This constitutes a human-non-human duality that kills the experimental agency of the cat before it even enters the box. In the concluding chapter of Meeting the Universe Halfway, Brad introduces the concept of biomimesis as a way of exploring how mimetic procedures may involve non-human actors, as well as how they may excuse the logics of reflection performatively produce difference rather than sameness. Brad uses the example of girl stars as such biomimetic agents, whose entire skeleton forms a big eye, consisting of 10,000 spherically domed calcite crystals that function as microlenses. Thus allowing these accreditors to see their surroundings. In a post-human sense, biomimesis refers both to the human desire to borrow design solutions from other biological organisms. In this case, the little star's remarkable crystal lenses could lead to better microlenses for optical networks, for instance. And to the little star's own biodynamic capabilities to transform its coloration or to reconfigure its body boundaries by breaking off parts of its body and regrowing them to protect itself from predators. Continuing to develop the most humanist of epistemology, Brad uses the example of the Brittle Star visual system to once again undo the geometrical optic, optics models that position language or representation at the lens that mediates between the object and the subject. Instead, the latent biodynamics that the Brittle Star engages in are simultaneously both discursive and material practices with which it reappears its bodily boundaries and makes meaning in an interactive relation with its environment. And here I quote from Brad. That is, its differential materialization is discursive, inhaling causal practices, reconfiguring boundaries and properties that matter to its very existence. In other words, the Brittle Star's epistemological practices of being and knowing open both its material and its discursive figurations simultaneously in a lot of likeness of indeterminacy and change. Simply put, meaning not generated independently, but always in dynamic process of matter. According to Barat, representationalist models are founded on the assumption that objects have pre predetermined quality that exist prior to their involvement in phenomena and that matter is passive and immutable. Matter and meaning, perhaps, such a best, are inextricably fused together, and no, event, no matter how energetic, can tear them asunder. Matter is simultaneously a matter of substance and significance. From Brad's agential realist perspective, the discursive and the material arise simultaneously through an entangled becoming. The significance of this simultaneity is that the material constitution of the world does not somehow lie on a separate plane, with language resting on top of it, forming a more ephemeral, flimsier layer of representation, and pointing occasionally downwards in reference to the stiff chunks of matter beneath. In fact, in Brad's account, there are no stiff chunks of matter, no discrete entities that pre exist and encounter. Rather, the world is continuously being made and being made through interactions. And here I quote again. In an agential realist account, matter does not refer to a fixed substance. Rather, matter is substance in its interactive becoming, not a thing, but a doing, a congenial agency. Matter is a stabilizing and destabilizing process of iterative interactivity. 
In emphasizing the world's radical aliveness, Brad is developing a new ontology in, a, in an attempt to rework the nature of both relationality and aliveness, vitality, dynamism, agency. Brad's insistence here on the co-constitution of matter and meaning need not be seen as a repudiation of language's capacity for meaning making. Rather, Brad takes her cue from Foucault and his notion of discourse. Discourse is not equivalent to speech acts or linguistic statements. That is, discursive practices set the material conditions for the production of meaning. In claiming discourse rather than language as a humane set of intervention, Brad is signaling a divergence between her methodology and the category of the material semiotic that was proposed by Donna Haraway. One of the strengths of Brad's approach comes from her desire to hear as meaning and matter as simultaneous occurrences both of which carry within them the line of capacity for change in determinacy and historicity. However, unlike Haraway's approach, which leaves room for metaphoricity of figuration, Brad is wary of metaphor with its proclivity to groups analogies across scales or ecological domains of nature and culture. But how can we think the linguistic and the material together, particularly when Brad insists that her approach and the lessons of the quantum imaginary not be metaphorized. Let's return to Stein's frog for a moment. One way to view the relationship that Stein posits between language and a living organism is to think of this as a spinoff. A story is simply like a frog jumping, in that they share similar dynamics of change. And Stein is using the image of a jumping frog as a metaphor to illustrate her understanding of how variation and repetition occur in language. In other words, there are, there are no real codes in this imaginary garden. But what if we read the example of Stein's frog not as an analogy between two discrete ontological layers, in which language acts only as a reflective surface for the liveliness of biological organisms, but even as a metaphor which in a Aristotelian sense, implies a discreteness of entities and a separability between language and matter, in which words have the ability to carry qualities from one site to another, while matter remains discrete and fixed in its properties. What if instead we read this example through Farad's diffractive methodology as a lively entanglement, which refuses to be clearly parsed into language on one hand and matter on the other? One of the main premises of Brad's diffractive methodology is the rejection of representationalism with its accompanying metaphoric of optical reflection. Stein herself is critical of the representational logic of description, preferring instead to think of her, her portraits as compositions which create the liveliness of existence. And here I quote from Stein. If this existence is this thing is actually pre existed, there can be no recognition. There is only recognition when there are descriptions being given of these things, not when the things themselves are actually existing, and this is therefore how the portrait writing began. Thus, it is inner ability that allows us to break out of the reflective objects of traditional metaphor. If we want the sense that language and matter cannot be dissociated, and that they are not linked to the objects of reflection, the metaphor itself is to operate as both a material and a discursive procedure. Or, as Canadian poet Peter Robertson explains, metaphorical states can't be inhabitable without welcoming meaning's propensity to move across material. The sense of a link between metaphor and materiality is already there in the recent developments in cognitive linguistics, for instance, which emphasize the way that embodied experience shapes abstract concepts. A post-humanist poetics of matter, in which humans and non-humans emerge as partaking in the world's active engagement in practices of knowing and meaning making, requires a broader conception of semiotic materiality, along which the metaphoric transactions of meaning and matter can ripple and move. Ada's discussion about the vitality of metaphors might lead us to wonder, what if our interpretive gestures turn out to be as redundant as the scientist's observation what if meaning is already dead or alive before we open our books? But I will say that our interpretations are not as redundant as I have been suggested. 
Rather, I want to take this question as an opportunity to think more carefully about how we are making our gentle cuts and about the particular situations in which they matter, whether and how our interpretive gestures make a difference. Although I'd prefer to be wrong about this, both the fundamental indeterminacy of reality and the generativity of knowledge would probably matter for literary criticism only either analogically or to allow us to develop a more complex and correct account of agency. Barat herself wrote an article whose non-continuous structure entangling Hamlet, Heisenberg, and Boris Denmark with Derrida's specters of Marx, quote, provides the reader with an opportunity to engage in an imaginative journey that is akin to how electrons experience the world, unquote. Barad's formal experiment is, however, only an analog rather than an actual experience of entanglement or indeterminacy, or it's no more entangled than anything else. To be clear, even if we did join ourselves with an apparatus capable of being marked by the literal material of some particular book in a way we could account for objectively, it would likely not matter much for our interpretation of its text. I'm less interested in the applicability of Brad's theories for literary studies as a move in which we simply transpose quantum physics onto literary interpretation. Instead, I believe that what is at stake in Brad's work requires a more fundamental reconfiguration of philosophical assumptions that underlie specific disciplinary formations, which cannot be achieved by a simple transfer of methodology from one field to another. Instead, I would like to propose that Brad's work with its insistence on the impossibility of dissociating matter and meaning opens up the possibility for articulating a poetics of matter. That said, we could and should always extend our notion of the proper object of textual studies. And that said, when we make ontological claims or claims about agency or the character of time, as any scholar in the post-humanities must and as most humanities scholars do implicitly, we should have Barat in mind, at minimum to keep us from mistakes about the fundamental operations of reality. This is no small matter. Having read The New Materialists, we can no longer be sure about fixed distinctions between subject and object, agency and mechanical causality and their attendant hierarchies, nor can we be sure that ethics or ethical significance requires self-awareness, whatever that is. We must abandon the world picture of classical physics, with its comforting assurances of our subjective separability from the world and our persistence in it, or even out of it. The New Materialists need Barad, because a particular training gives ontologists and ethicists empirical support for their systems, although I suspect some critics will only find that Barad confirms their preferred world system. Zizek discovers in Barad a fundamental, quote, self-relating pure difference preceding the terms it differentiates, unquote, at the heart of things. Of course he does, and I'm sure I'm guilty of my own interpretation, which is in fact one of Barad's points. For my take on what Barad's work can teach us about why and how our interpretive cuts matter, Let's revisit Schrodinger and his cat one last time. Although we said the experimenter's observation is redundant, we have to ask. Redundant relative to which phenomenon? The opening of the box is certainly redundant with regard to the phenomenon of the cat dying or not. That cut has already been made. But the observation can make a difference in the domain of scientific knowledge, and as such can constitute a new phenomenon in scientific discourse. Likewise, Although many cuts have been made prior to our opening a work of literature, this does not foreclose the possibility of making new cuts to intervene in literary discourse. It just constrains the kind of phenomenon in which we can intervene. Although, although our interpretation of literary texts may not be able to change that text's history, it can change that text's present. We must understand our interpretations as mattering within the context of a contemporary literary phenomenon. And literary critics are not the only actors involved in constituting this phenomenon. A responsible interpretive cut, one that accounts for all the agents involved in constituting a phenomenon, must move beyond the encounter between text and critic to incorporate not only the historical conditions of the text production, but also the contemporary theoretical, political, and ideological conditions of the critic's production. This heralds the death of the critic as a corollary to the death of the author. Instead of holding fast to the human-non-human -human duality that kills the cat, let us take up Barad's non-exceptional account of interpretive agency to kill, or at least to humble, the critic. 
Humility, as we all know when we are absorbed in vast spaces and absorbed by vast times, is also a matter of scale. If the scales opened up by science make us feel smaller, they also make us more intimate with the past in more proximate relationship to our ancestors, whether they wrote in chalk and ochre on cave walls or on animal skin. While we contemplate the analogical validity of quantum entanglement for our contemporary ethics, we might also contemplate its validity for our understanding of our relationship to the past. As quantum medievalists, our polylogs opened up spaces and times large enough to put ourselves in closer proximity to one another and to the past, to become entangled in it, to sense the historical meaning of Einstein's barb about entanglement, spooky action at a distance, which we might recast as a certain spooky intimacy of subjects rescaled into contact with one another, traversing bodies and times through the brains we extend into the world, even as the world passes through them. Now, folks, I want to thank you very, very much for inviting me into your home. I am deeply grateful. And please remember, help control the pet population. Have your pets spayed or neutered. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>